Storehouse Dallas. Man, honor is wonderful, isn't it? I love honor. Um, all right, so yeah, I'm covering the life of William Branham. Now, for those of you that don't know um, William Branham, I'm going to be telling you the story about his life. And But there's a reason why I'm covering William Branham today and the reason why I wanted to talk about him. Um, you know, he was a great man, and we should always uh, try to honor great men who have gone before us and brought the kingdom of heaven to the earth. But um, I love history and I love to honor the fathers of the faith and the generals of the faith. Um, I just think it's a good thing to do. But that's not why I'm telling you about William Branham today. The Lord actually has been talking to us about this. And so I wanted to share with you um, what I believe the Lord is saying. So I'm going to set it up with the prophetic. I'm going to tell the life of, about the life of William Branham. And then I'm going to follow it with the prophetic just to kind of sandwich it. Um, so about three weeks ago, uh, the Lord gave me a dream. I was actually taking a nap in the nursing mother's room, which, by the way, is a great place to nap because there's absolutely zero light in there, and there's a great couch, which I bought for the purpose of m nursing mothers and napping. <laughs> so uh, hopefully it'll put nursing mothers to sleep because they never get any sleep. Um, but... Uh, I, I, I went into this dream, and immediately, as I closed my eyes, I was caught up in this dream. And in the dream, I heard the Lord say, um, I am releasing a revival that started 72 years ago. So the coming revival is from 72 years ago. So I woke up from that. He said it several times in the dream. That's all the dream was about, was the voice of the Lord saying that to me. And so I was a little, um, you know dumbfounded by that because, you know, I was like, okay, what's my math? Okay. Was that Azusa Street? You know, that's the revival. What are you talking about? So I did my math and it was 1946. And I thought, 1946, I know Azusa Street started before 1946. And so as I looked it up, I found uh, that it was the beginning of what they call today the Latter Rain Revival, which was started by William Branham. It is also referred to as a healing revival. And, um, and so I thought, oh, okay, well, I'm very familiar with William Branham. I'm familiar with his stuff. I've actually had uh, five books that look like, um, they're like little blue books, five of these um, on his life. And um, it had been a while since I'd read them, almost 10 years. And so I dusted them off and I began to read again because I wanted to see what the Lord had to say. Um, however, on that particular day that I had the dream, that evening I went into a prayer meeting and we're all there and we're getting ready to pray and we had invited a guest pastor to come. And she said to me, um, the Lord told me to bring you this book on William Branham. And I'm like, okay, well, that's kind of interesting. So here's what happens. When the Lord begins to speak, he begins to speak multiple times about the same thing. And um, so then I was in prayer one day, and, um, and I was kind of perusing through some of the dreams that the Lord had given us um, over the last year. And um, so this one pops up, and the title of it, it was from March 20th, 2017. Um, it's a dream that I had, and it, I titled it, Revival Reign of Healing. Um, now, all of these guys, uh, the thing about William Branham, he had several contemporaries, and um, one of them was the guy that started uh, CF&I, um, Gordon Lindsay, and he, he wrote a magazine that covered all of the testimonies of what William Branham and some of the others were doing, like Oral Roberts, A.A. A. Allen, Jack Coe. All of these guys began to flow in a similar anointing, but not as great as William Branham. And so here's the dream. I saw a life-size magazine cover like a banner. It was the voice of healing and had Oral Roberts on the cover. It was in the basement of CF&I. It was highlighted for such a time as this. 
I felt the Lord was saying that what has been hidden in the basement is coming forth. The latter rain revival is coming back. Get ready because it's about to rain from heaven. Revival rain of healing. But this time, the anointing of Oral Roberts, A.A. A. Allen, and many others that they walked in will be distributed to his remnant. Those who've been tested in the fire of adversity and betrayal will now be raised up in resurrection power. Hallelujah. So that was then, and here we are now. And, um, and so I want to talk about this life of William Branham because you have to understand what, if God is bringing something, if God is restoring something, if God is about to revisit the earth with something, it's good to know what that something is. Because when we begin to see it, we'll be like, oh, this is that that you have spoken of. And that's what I love about the prophetic. Every time the prophetic is released, what it does is it creates an initiation of something. So as I'm speaking, what I'm doing is I'm actually jump-starting and releasing words so that the Holy Spirit can then take like, like paddles to, to the spirit realm and begin to shock it so it begins to come down to the earth. Amen? And as you agree with the words that are spoken, then that of course, initiates it as well. Okay, so the life of William Branham. Um, William Branham was born actually to a Texas girl who moved to the backwoods of Kentucky. Um, and uh, she was about 14 years old when she got married and she was 15 years old when she had William. She had been, her husband had gone out hunting on a, to try to find meat because it was the cold of the winter. They were dirt poor. And when I say dirt poor, uh, they had a dirt floor. They had no plumbing. I think we've got a picture of the house that they were born in. He was born in. So as you can see, uh, none of the amenities that we have here in Dallas. So no one gets to complain. <laughs> um, so they had one window. Uh, it had no glass in it. Um, it was freezing cold in that uh, winter that he was born. It was snowing, it was, uh, it was, the temperature had dropped well below zero. There's no heating. Um, she had, she did not have any firewood um, when she went into labor. Um, so there was nothing to keep her warm. And so here she is going into labor. Her husband is gone, she has no one to help her. And um, she's not a believer. Um, her husband's not a believer. They don't come, they don't come from any, they have no legacy in the Lord. So there she is just terrified about what's going to happen to her now that she's about to have her first baby. And, um, fortunately, um, someone who lives, uh, nearby was out chopping wood in the snow and he saw that there was no smoke coming from her fireplace and so he went over there brought her some wood lit the fire and then the grandmother ends up showing up who had given birth to 17 children and he she uh, midwifed him so as she midwifes him um it's like <clears throat> early in the morning 4 a.m all of the sudden, she gives birth to William, and as she does, they are completely in the dark. There is no light. There is no lantern. There is no nothing. A light comes flying in to the room out of the open window that has no glass, and it begins to hover over little baby William. They're all standing there looking at it like, don't know what to do, kind of staring at it. It sat there for a while over his body, and then it jetted out through the window the same way that it came in. Now, they didn't want, know what to make of that. They just thought it was something that was odd and extraordinary, but not being religious people, they had no idea what that meant. They were dirt poor. His father was illiterate and also an alcoholic. When he was young, they were so poor that he would go to school without a shirt on. 
His mother couldn't even afford, they couldn't afford clothing and what they had, they would make and remake and then they would tear it apart and then they would make it again and then they would make it again. He had no shoes and the shoes that he finally did get were a size too small for him. So when he did go to school, he went to school and his toes were curled under. So uh, one of the neighbors took pity on him during the cold of the Kentucky winter when he was about seven years old and gave him a coat. And he was so ashamed and embarrassed at the fact that he didn't have a shirt to go to school in that he wore the coat even when it warmed up. And the coat, he would sweat and his friends would make fun of him. But he was so embarrassed at the fact that he didn't have a shirt that he just kept that coat on. When he was in elementary school, He was running around out back of his house, and all of the sudden, he heard a sound that sounded like whoosh. And this wind came around him and began to swirl around him. He was under a tree, and the tree began, as the wind began to blow in the tree, he heard the sound of a voice. And the voice said to him, don't ever drink smoke, or defile your body in any way. There will be a work for you to do when you get older. Now, he's seven. He has no grid for this whatsoever. And he thought, that's so weird. The wind is talking. And so, but the thing about that voice was, is that it really made an impression on him like something indelible that was written on his heart. So for the rest of his life, as a teenager, and he's growing up now, now he ended up, as far as he went in his education, he only went to elementary school. That's as far as he went, because after that, he had to get a job and begin to help support his family. So as a teenager, and someone who could barely read, and whose grammar and English wasn't very good... Here he is, and he's out with all of his friends, his backwood friends, and his dad actually makes moonshine because he's an alcoholic, and so he's tempted time after time after time, and it's back in in the 19, you know, 20s and 30s, and so he's tempted to to have some alcohol and and to smoke cigarettes. But every time that he like does it and there's peer pressure and people are making fun of him because you know he's he's so pure at heart and he doesn't want to do any of these things that he he'll get tempted and then he'll start to do it. And guess what he hears? That wind would come along and all of the sudden he would hear the whoosh. And he would immediately put the cigarette down. He would immediately put the drink down. Not one cigarette and not one drink ever passed his lips. Then at 22, um, he had an appendicitis and almost died. And during the near-death experience, he found himself in the same place out back of his house with the whirlwind saying, don't ever drink, smoke, or defile your body in any way. I have called you. Why have you not gone? That voice said that to him three times, and then all of a sudden, he was back in his body. After that, um, he told the Lord, he said, I promise you, I will serve you all of the days of my life. And he began to read the Bible, and he began to have encounters with the Lord he didn't fully understand what was happening to him. All he knew is that he began to have these visions. He began to go into these visions, and the visions that he had would show him people that he didn't know and places that he'd never been, that he was healing people. It would be like seeing a movie of the exact representation of a future event that he hadn't even experienced yet. And so he had one of these visions. And he thought, like the first time all of us had a vision, right? We were like, what is happening? (laughs) Am I going crazy? 
Um, what he saw was a man in a hospital bed, and he saw the detailed decoration in the room in the corner where his wife was seated. He described this to a friend who said, oh, I think I know who that guy is. He's in the hospital right now. I, do you think we should go see him? And William said, I don't know, I guess. I don't know what's going on. This, I don't know what this means, but yeah, let's go see him because in the vision, I, the guy got healed when I prayed for him. And so they're like, okay, so off they go to the hospital. They walk in the hospital room. Everything in the vision, everything in the hospital room is the exact same as the vision. The wallpaper on the walls was exactly the same. His wife was sitting in the corner reading the book exactly in the same way as in the vision. He was covered with one of those oxygen tents exactly as it was in the vision. Now, this man had about 104 temperature. He had a terrible infection in his body. He had broken ribs. He couldn't move, and they didn't want him to move because he would puncture. They were afraid he'd puncture a lung, and, or he did puncture a lung, and there was very little oxygen going on in his body. So he was in critical condition, very, very ill. And so when they walked in, when William Branham walked in, you know, he's not a pastor. He's not anything. He just, well, I just got saved. Um, and so when he walked in, he told the wife, you know, I I feel like that the Lord showed me your husband and I feel like I'm supposed to pray for him and heal him. And the wife said, do not touch my husband. My husband is very sick. And if you do this, you could kill him. You could make him worse. And so she told him, no, you can't do that. He slides his hand under the oxygen tent and puts his hand on the man's stomach and says, be healed in Jesus' name. The man immediately is healed, jumps up and begins to leave his bed. And all of the nurses come running in and they're all like, don't leave the bed. And so they make him lay back down. They shoo William Branham and his friend out and tell him, you have got to get out of here. Look what you've done. And, uh, and so as they're walking out, William Branham and his friend, he, said, he stops him on the steps of the hospital and he said, don't go anywhere. They, I just saw a vision. They're going to come down these steps and he's going to have what they, he called, I think, a pill hat and a brown coat on and they're going to come out any minute. And so they sat there and they waited. And within 10 minutes, out comes the man in a brown jacket and a pill hat with his wife declaring his healing. Well, I know, hallelujah, right? So the so that got put in the paper, and so all of a sudden, um, people are beginning to know who he is. Who is this guy? Um, and so after that, he became a Baptist minister. He started going to, he said he went to all of these different churches, and all of the different churches were like, our way is the only way. You need to do this. You need to do that. But nobody was talking about visions. And nobody was talking about the voice of the Lord. And nobody was talking about prophecy. And so he's like, well, I haven't read the Bible, but... Uh, okay, so you're telling me I need to make a casserole and I need to go and I need to work all and do all this kind of stuff. He said the church looked very busy, but nobody was talking to him about what he was experiencing. And so he began to have additional visions and he would just do what the visions were telling him to do. And most of the time he didn't have to go find the people in the visions. The people would actually find him or they would be along his path of what what he would be doing in that day. Isn't that amazing? How easy is that? So he's working as he, he's, he's working for the utility company and he was called to someone's house and he was looking at the water meter and, every, and everything. And so he's trying to determine because the house is, it was a duplex, which one the water meter was for, which, which one of these houses in this duplex. So he went and he knocked on the door and he had seen a vision that morning of, a, of an elderly woman who's, um, who was crippled. And so the little girl answers the door and all of a sudden as she answers the door, he realizes that within that doorway is the vision of the house that he had seen. And in a hospital bed within the house is this crippled woman who had not walked in seven 17 years. And so <clears throat> he said, oh, um, I think I'm supposed to pray for you. And so he kind of walks in and he's like, and the little girl's like, 
wait, you're the meter man. What are you doing? And he said, you know, I had a vision. I had a, the Lord showed me your mother and she was sitting there and she was holding an Armenian Bible. And he said, are you, are you a believer? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? And she said, I was praying that the Lord would heal me just this morning. And he said, well, I think that the Lord has answered your prayer because he sent me here and I saw in my vision that you got healed when I prayed for you. And so the daughter and the little girl, the little girl's like backing away and she's like with her little cousins and they're all standing there going, what is the meter man doing to our grandmother? We don't know. And um, so he prays for her and when he lays hands on her stomach, again, her twisted legs go straight immediately and one of her lame arms grows out right in front of him. The little girls scream in terror because they have no idea what is happening. And the grandmother, in the first time in 17 years, turns her legs around her bed and stands up and begins to praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. All right, so he begins to work in the Baptist church, and as he does this... The leadership of the Baptist church are like, okay, we're not really sure about this, but we are just really not saying anything. We're just kind of going along with it. And then he was baptizing people in a lake. There were like 50 people he was baptizing. And as he was baptizing them, all of a sudden, a light, a light like a star falls from heaven over him and people start screaming because everybody can see it. And he looks up and he's like, oh, (laughs) what in the world? And he himself, the testimony is, he didn't know what to do. He's just this backwards Kentucky guy with no education, like, ah, there's a light what do we do? And so he starts to talk to the Lord and all of a sudden out of the light, a voice comes and says this, as John the Baptist was sent to forerun the first coming of Jesus Christ, so you are sent with a message to forerun his second coming. Now it was not only, not only did he hear that, but there were several people that heard it and other people heard what sounded like thunder. It was reported in the newspaper that there was a pastor or a minister of the gospel baptizing people in the water, and that, and then a star appeared over him. So uh, it, this became news, and so he's kind of getting a reputation, a little bit of a reputation. By the way, after the star showed up and the voice showed up, everybody got in the water to be baptized, <laughs> even those that were just standing by and looking. So the uh, so. Um, Next, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and showed him that his, his tabernacle, he was thinking, oh, I'm going to have a church someday. And the Lord's like, mm, yeah, okay. Uh, no, yes and no. But he, he, the Lord said, no, this is your tabernacle. And as the angel of the Lord spoke to him, every he saw like uh, this huge orchard of trees And he said, uh, the angel of the Lord said this three times, the harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. The harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. And a giant wind came up and began to stir the trees and the fruit just began to spontaneously fall off the trees. And the angel of the Lord said, 2 Timothy 4 is going to be very important. And so I want to read that to you. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when there will not in, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Oh, wait, I think I wrote that twice. Um, But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. 
And so that really became the foundation of the word for his ministry. Um, and, and what he found is that his ministry was unlike any ministry that had gone before it since the time of Jesus. So he was a forerunner. Nobody in his generation had seen the level of power that he was walking in. So soon after he gets married, he goes on vacation with his new wife, and he, ac he accidentally on the vacation, he kind of sees all of these signs for this Pentecostal national convention. And he's like, what is that? And so he goes in there to this Pentecostal national convention, and these people have their hands raised, and they're clapping, and they're shaking. And he's like, this is not like the church that I'm in. There is something so weird about this. And he said, these people, this is just, at first he was so offended. He was like, this is so disrespectful. All of these people, look at that. And then the more that he stayed there, the more that he saw the passion and the love and the desire and the earnestness and the zealousness of these people for Jesus. And he, saw, and he, and he thought to himself, wait a minute, this is an authentic worship. They are authentically worshiping with total abandon. And he's like, I think I like this. The power of God is so heavy in this place. So they asked, it was kind of interesting, of course, led by the Holy Spirit, but they asked, they said, hey, is there anybody here who is a, a pastor, a visiting pastor that has been a pastor for less than, I think they said a year, well, so somebody standing next to him that he had met said, oh, William Branham is, has only been, and he's like, what? So they said, come up here. We want you to preach today. <laughs> and he's like, terrified. So he takes his Bible up and he's like, sweating. He's like, oh Lord, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? So he, his Bible falls open to a verse and he's like, okay, this is as good as any. I'm just gonna preach out of this verse. <laughs> so it was, it, was a, it was a very fire and brimstone kind of hell, uh, uh, you know, you get better get saved and you know. So the whole place, as he's preaching this message, the whole place like falls on their faces, repenting, running to the altar. You know, we want to be cleansed. We want to be healed. We want to blah, 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 blah. And it, and it was just incredible. After that, after he preached, he's outside and all of these guys are all pastors, you know? So they all start handing him pieces of paper with their names and telephone numbers. I want you to come to my church. I want you to come to my church. And he left there with a handful of, of, of invitations to churches all over America. It was the fulfillment of what he had been told by the angel of the Lord, that he would have a ministry where he would minister all over America, right? That he would go, he would be called out, that he would be a sent one, so he gets home and he tells his new wife, he's like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. Meanwhile, you know, she's pregnant. She's got a new one. I think she may have just had a baby um, and um, actually have another on the way. So she, uh, they're visiting her mother. Her mother was a staunch Baptist. Never get out of that box. And so he told the, his mother-in-law, this is what we're going to do. I have all these invitations, and we're going to go travel and preach the gospel and heal the sick. And so the mother-in-law said this, I'll never give my daughter permission to go out with a bunch of holy rolling trash like that. She was very adamant about the fact her daughter was not going anywhere. And so he's thinking, okay, what am I going to do if, if I can't do this? If I, if I don't get permission from my mother-in-law, how am I going to do this? <clears throat> so he said no to the call. To soothe his disobedience, William wrote a little book, and it was called God is the Same Yesterday, to, same yesterday Today, and Forever. 
and he put testimonies of some of the people who had been healed so far through his ministry in the book. And after a time, in, the, in, the, in, in his book, it's, uh, the title of this chapter is called The Dark Curtain Goes Down. He begins to really struggle, and his wife begins to struggle with illnesses. And um, his wife and his daughter, his wife ends up dying um, through a series of circumstances. And four days later, um, he buries his uh, nine-month-old daughter. And he's just totally devastated because he's still walking in power, but yet his life is falling apart. And in the book, he assigns it <clears throat> to his disobedience to the call. That's what he said. So he continues to walk in incredible power. He continues to do the same. Th I mean, he's healing people. He's having these incredible visions. But he knows in his heart that this isn't the national revival that the Lord was talking about because he's, he's in a local community healing people in a local community. After a while, many in the Baptist church leadership began to tell him that these voices were demons and they were not God. And so he began to question, especially with everything that had just happened to him, with his wife dying, his daughter dying. He can heal all these other people, but his wife and his daughter die. You know how the enemy comes in and begins to speak when things aren't going well. He begins to accuse you. You're not really hearing from God. Those are demons. You're not really. And then the, the people that are supposed to be working with him and helping him, they began to say to him, no, 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 this isn't you. And one of the pastors, uh, his, the guy that he considered to be um, his mentor and really good friend um, told him, as he told him, you know, that I was supposed to go out and have a national revival, he said, you mean you're going to go and preach to the world and win thousands to Christ? You, with your seventh grade education, But I will tell you that I heard Lou Ingalls say this yesterday. He said, I dare to believe the prophetic words over my life rather than go down in a heap of mediocrity. And so William Branham had that resolve in his heart. And he said, and this is what the angel, so he goes into a cave because now he's really conflicted. Now he's like, I don't know what to do. Because, I, because I'm, my, my leadership is telling me one thing, but God is telling me another. I'm seeing people healed, but yet these are the experts, and these are the people that I've trusted. So, Lord, I need to hear from you. So he goes out, and he goes into a cave that he used to go to when he was a little boy. And I want to read you what the angel of the Lord said to him when he appeared. So he's in this dark cave without a light. There's nothing there but him in complete darkness. And all of a sudden, he sees this amber light. And out of the amber light, a small amber light begins to grow. And out of the amber light, he sees a figure. And he hears footsteps. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I would be hovered in a corner going, g -g 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 -g. So the angel of the Lord walks in and he says this, do not fear. He said it was the same voice that had spoken to him out of the tree when he was a little boy that said, don't ever drink, smoke, or defile your body in any way. There will be a work for you to do when you get older. So this is what the angel of the Lord told him. I am sent from the presence of Almighty God to tell you that your peculiar birth and misunderstood life has been to indicate that you are to take the gift of divine healing to the peoples of the world. If you will be sincere when you pray and can get the people to believe you, nothing shall stand before your prayer, not even cancer. 
You will go into many parts of the earth and will pray for kings and rulers and pontinates. You will preach to multitudes the world over and thousands will come to you for counsel. You must tell them that their thoughts speak louder in heaven than their words. Okay, I'm going to say that again. You must tell them that their thoughts speak louder in heaven than their words. So he, of course, did a, he pulled a Moses. <clears throat> but how can I go? I only have a grammar school education. The angel's face grew stern, and he said, As the prophet Moses was given two signs to prove he was sent from God, so you will be given two signs. First, when you take a person's right hand and your left hand, you will be able to detect the presence of any germ-caused disease by vibrations that will appear in your left hand. Then you must pray for the person. If your hand returns to normal, you will pronounce the person healed. If it doesn't, just ask a blessing and walk away. Under the anointing of God, do not try to think your own thoughts. It will be given to you what to say. The second sign will be greater than the first. If you will stay humble and sincere, it will come to pass that you will be able to tell by vision the very secrets of their hearts. Then the people will have to believe this will initiate the gospel in power that will bring the second coming of Jesus Christ. So they began to, and so then the angel began to talk to him about um, the doctrine of healing and the doctrine of power. And, um, and he ended with this. He said, listen, because he was like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I'm a poor guy, blah, 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 blah. Let me give you all the, let me give you the laundry list of reasons why I can't do what you're telling me to do. He said, it will not be you who accomplishes any of this. It will be the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, and I will be with you. Whenever you experience the same feeling that you feel now in my presence, you will know that I am standing by. And so after that, William Branham was initiated 1946 into his full-time ministry as a preacher of the gospel in power. He would hold these rev tent revivals. People would line up. At first, they would all be there. He would pull one person who was sick up, and he would hold their hand. And in his hand, uh, white spots would appear. He began to know what the patterns of the white spots were, and whatever the pattern was, it told him what disease the person had. The person didn't even have to tell him what they were sick with. He told them what they were sick with. And then he cast out the demon of that disease. The demon would leave and the spots on his hand would disappear and they would be healed. He would pray for up to 3,000 people individually a night. They would literally cart off his body because the power of the, uh, because the angel of the Lord is the one that would be standing there with him. And the power of that anointing would sap all of his physical energy. And they said that he was even partially delusional after they brought him on the stage, not knowing where he was, not knowing who anybody was who he was looking at, even though it, he may have known them. And so it would take him a while, and they would have to talk to him about circumstances and stuff to bring him back down to kind of an earthly position. He saw the most remarkable healings. He saw um, amputated legs grow out. People without limbs, the limbs would grow out. Without eyes, the eyes would pop back in their socket. The blind was healed. The deaf received their sight. There was not one sickness or disease that stood before this man. He healed them all. There was one man that came to him, and I'm going to tell these two stories, and then I'm going to go into the prophetic. There was one man. Are you guys okay? There was one man who came to him, <clears throat> who was trying to trick him. And, um, and he came up and he gave him a card. They started this prayer line where everybody would put on there the card and he would call out numbers because there was just mass amounts of people. So he brought this card and as he brought it, it said on here, there that the man had um, multiple sclerosis. 
And so he grabbed his hand and nothing appeared on the back of his hand. And he said, brother, you do not, you are healed. There's nothing wrong with you. And the man said, no, 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 I, I do. I, I have this. And he said, no, you don't have this. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit, a vision opened up and he saw that that man, he said, I see you last night. You were at a table with a woman in a green dress and another pastor. You're a pastor at a church in this city and you have come to mock the Holy Spirit And he said, from this day forward, you will have the very thing that you tried to test the Lord in. The man fell down and had multiple sclerosis for the rest of his life. Yeah, right? So then uh, he goes to Houston. He's invited to Houston for this big revival. And as he gets down there... Um, a, a man named uh, Dr. Best, who's uh, one of the leaders in the Baptist church, he uh, had, was a do- had a doctorate in um, theology. He uh, put an ad in the Houston Chronicle, and he said, I challenge you to a debate. I think you are a charlatan, and I think you have come to deceive the people of God, and I want to debate you in the word. And, and so uh, a guy named F.F. F. Bosworth, who is about 80 years old, who used to travel with him, who was also a teacher himself, um, he said, uh, you know, how can you stand for this? You cannot stand for this man mocking you in this way. You know, he is coming against the living God that you serve. And, and um, William said, oh, I don't care, whatever. I'm just going to heal people. That guy can think whatever he wants. So he puts another ad and another paper and again challenges him and says the same thing. So he said, um, F.F. Bosworth said, let me go, I'll debate him. And so he said, all right, fine, you go. So he goes, but he goes to the Houston, one of these huge Houston arenas. There are thousands of people. This place is packed out. This guy, Dr. Best, hired a photographer that sat nearby. And he's like, I want to I wanna capture this. I want to capture the fact that I'm about to bring down a man that is mocking God with all of these fake uh, signs and wonders, right? So William was like, I'm not going. You do it, whatever, And then William kind of sneaks in the back during the debate. And he's sitting up high in the rafters. He's in the back. He's got a hat on. He's got his collar up. He doesn't want anybody to know he's there. And so he's just watching them debate Dr. Nalini. He's like, this is actually a lot of fun. And then all of a sudden, um, F.F. Bosworth... Uh, uh, not F.F. Bosworth, but the Dr. Best stands up and he starts pointing his finger in the face of F.F. Bosworth. And he's like, you are, da, 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 and he starts yelling at him, even though he was actually losing the debate. And so Dr. Best calls the photographer up and he wants him to capture the moment of him sticking his finger in this guy's face. And so the photographer, who's paid by him, is taking pictures of everything that he's doing. All of a sudden, William Branham, minding his own business, sitting at the top, hears whoosh. And he's like, oh, no. (laughs) Oh, no. I'm not going down there. I'm not going down there. Whoosh. He's like, all right, all right, all right. So he starts to walk down. And as he starts to walk down, people see a light that's following him. And people are like, oh, wait, what is that? What is that? What is that? He gets on the stage. <clears throat> the angel of the Lord appears behind him. People are aghast. They are yelling now. They're seeing this with their eyes. And a light begins to hover over his head, and he begins to call out people that are sick in the crowd, and he begins a revival healing service right there. So the photographer is seeing this, and he's like, click, 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 click. So he starts to take these this picture. So he captures this picture of this light over his head. That's an actual thing. I mean, it, everybody could see it with their blind eye. This wasn't like, oh, I see it with this, you know, the eyes of my heart. No, this was right there for everybody to see. So the photographer goes back to develop his film. You know, that's when they used to have the black rooms and goes back to develop the film. And lo and behold, nothing wrong with his camera, but all of the pictures that he took of Dr. Best pointing his finger at F.F. Bosworth were black. And the only picture that was on the roll of film was this photo right here. The Lord had erased everything else 
I will make my name great in the nations. And no one will mock the living God. Amen? All right, so we're almost done. Hold on, guys. <clears throat> All right. In 1965, uh, William Branham now has had about... Um, you know, a 20-year ministry. And he's in his 50s. And, um, and he finished one of his revival services, and one of his organ players who traveled with him was about 17 years old. And he was just loved being in the glory, but had never actually spoken to William. Because by the time William got up on stage, he was fasting and praying before he every single service, he would fast and pray. And then afterwards, he was so delusional and out of his mind with the power of God that it would take him a while. So he never actually conversed with him. All he saw were signs and wonders. And so that day, William, when he got off the stage, turned to him and said, hey, let's go grab some lunch. And he's like, I'm going to have lunch with the great man of God. Good. I will tell him about all of the ideas I have to take his, his, his services and his revival worldwide, right? So he gets there. He sits down. And he has lunch with him. And, and he's telling him, hey, I have some ideas. This would be great how to market your ministry better so that more people know about you so we can have even bigger revival services. And William Branham says, no, it's actually time. My time has come to an end, and the Lord is about to take me home. And so he said to him these, the following words that I'm going to read to you. He gives him a prophecy, not just for the time that he was living in, but for the time that you're living in. He said this, I've been in a season. We would lay hands one at a time. Blind eyes would open, lame would walk, etc. God is through with me. My season has come to a close, but another season is coming. This season is going to be a teaching and revelation of the word and of Jesus Christ and who we are in him and who he is in us. It's about Jesus in us and us in him. This season will last for a while and then it will come to a close then God is going to take every move that we have ever heard of in history and even what we have witnessed and seen in the Bible days and put it all together in one by Holy Spirit bomb and he's going to drop it on the earth. The nations will rock and reel with the power of God like we've never seen. Primetime news will cover the dead being raised and limbs growing back. You won't lay hands on them like we did. It'll be so large, auditoriums will not hold them. Tents won't be able to hold them. They will come to open fields all across America. God is going to bring the ministry of the apostles and the prophets to the forefront. They will have the mind of God and the heart of God and the voice of God. They will speak as the oracle of God. They will not speak about the future, but will create the future. Listen to what I just said. They will not prophesy about the future. They will actually create the future. Whatever they say, God will create because it will be his mind, his will, and his word. It will, be, it will not be about them, but it will be about him. So as I was writing this prophecy, because the Lord told me, he said, there's a prophetic word. And I'm, this guy's name is, um, so you can go look it up. His name is Buford Dowell. Um, I'm looking, the Lord said, there's a prophecy to this generation. Go look it up on YouTube. And I'm like, okay, how long is that going to take me? You know what I'm thinking? I, you know, I've, I've got like an hour, Lord. I've got an hour. And so the first video on YouTube that I open up is the prophecy. And I'm like, okay, thank you, Lord. Thank you for working with me here. Praise the Lord. 
But I want to tell you something that completely blew me away. And I've been doing this for 20 years, so it, it really takes a lot to blow me away. So I'm, I'm writing this down in this book. And every year, at the beginning of every year in January, I ask the Lord, tell me about what you have for this year. And I always write it on a journal. And so I get out my little, you know, I, I got from you, uh, not YouTube, from, from Amazon, you know, one of those little click, 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 click. You know, I write those down and I put them on my little journals. And I always get them black because I think it looks cool. Anyway, so this year, I wrote down a prophecy for 2018. And I'm writing down in it. Now, I haven't used this all year long because I couldn't find it until um, I found it. I don't know how it ended up, but it ended up under my chair. And when we had the prophetic conference, um, all of a sudden, there it was. And so I kind of started to write in it now and then. But I had it when I was watching the YouTube of the prophecy that I just read to you. So when I closed it, I looked at the front of this in the prophetic word for 2018, and I wrote down, creating the future, 2018. And I was like, oh, wow. You know how you, when you've, you're crying out to God to arrive? You're crying out to God to arrive, and you're like, God, I just want to be there. I just want to be there. And then the Lord is like, erg. Wait, something's up. Something is happening. Something is coming. The rain is coming again. The latter rain is on its way back. But this time, it's going to be so much greater than when William Branham walked the earth. And William Branham had the greatest ministry since Jesus Christ when he walked the earth. And he's saying that the latter rain is going to be greater than the former rain. And in that will be greater works than we saw when Jesus was on the earth. So I had a dream last week, or two weeks ago. And all of this is kind of swirling around. And I had a dream, and the Lord gave me a big machine that almost looked like a, uh, it looked like a, a car engine. And in the dream, of course, I was carrying it because I have supernatural powers in my dream. And so I'm carrying this, this, this thing, this machine, and I set it down on the coffee table in front of the white couch where I do my praying at night. And, um, and what the machine did is it measured Christ in me. And it did it by measuring light. And so I was cut in my heart because I realized, just as I had in the original dream, that we have arrived for such a time as this. And God is looking for a remnant who have the revelation of Christ in them and who have surrendered to a life of prayer and intimacy with him. And they have, they have said, God, I'm yours and you are mine. And I will sit before you, God. Search me out. I believe that the Holy Spirit and the eyes of the Lord are searching the earth to and fro right now. And he's looking at those that have oil in their lamps. Because he's about to throw fire on that oil, and we are going to walk in the same kind of power, the remnant, the remnant, and it's going to come out of Dallas, Texas. And he's saying, be about my business, because I'm not looking for the cool kids. I'm looking to see my son in the holy kids. We are in an hour and in a moment where God is marking his people that he is going to use in this next revival. And as it was with John, with John the Baptist, as it was with William Branham, he is looking for those who will have the longevity to hold the glory at that kind of level and not fall. Because it will be about him and not about us. 
It's going to be about the glory of God, not about building a ministry. It's going to be about the glory of God and not the gold and not the fame and not the fortune. So I don't know about you, but I'm pretty excited about this. But I just want to encourage you because there is a coming revival and it is going to shake the nations and God is going to use the people in this room to begin to facilitate it for such a time as this. I believe that Pentecost was a tithe of what the Lord is about to pour out in the earth. And every mountain of the earth, every mountain of education, business, um, um, the church, the family, help me out, entertainment, media, all of these mountains are about to come down and God's apostles and prophets are being raised up to govern in these places. For such a time as this, stand to your feet. I want to pray over you. I want you to, um, I'm going to pray, and I want you to very seriously think about what I'm about to say. Um, I believe that God is marking us. And I believe he's saying, will you answer the call to give me your schedule to meet with me even those that have done it in the past and you got tired and felt like this isn't working, this is never going to happen, I'm just going to go about building my own house, I feel like the Lord is saying, come back. Come back, it's time. It's time, it's here. 72 years ago is about to be revisited on us and to be poured out. And so he's saying to us, get your lives right. Get yourselves right before me. Get rid of offense. Get rid of unforgiveness. Get rid of the things. Get rid of judgment. Get rid of the things that will hinder us from walking in this kind of glory, in this kind of, of truth. There's an earth out there waiting for you to take dominion. It's groaning for the sons of God to rise up in glory and power. Because on the heels of this great revival is going to come some pretty horrible things. But God is bringing in the greatest harvest that the world has ever seen. Over a billion souls will come into his kingdom. He is about to blow the fruit off of these trees and he's going to use you to pick it up. So if this has quickened in your spirit and with all seriousness and earnestness of heart, if you want this, I want you to come forward because I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to mark you that the man dressed in linen that goes throughout the city with his ink pen and his ink quill begin to put on you the name of God, Jesus Christ, that you belong to him. And when that machine is placed in our homes, that it will register that Christ has fully taken up habitation. And we have become the Galatians 2.20 answer to what Jesus died on the cross for. That it is no longer I who lives, but it is Christ who lives on the inside of me. The days of living life and asking him to save us from our problems are over. We will not move. You will not move until you see him move. You will not speak until you hear him speak. And I declare this in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, I ask you to come now. Would you come now and would you mark us? 
for the day of your habitation. Not your visitation, but your habitation. And we just say, God, here we are, a company of people, 120 strong, those who are answering the call and saying, God, here I am, use me. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to begin to remove every distraction that would keep us from being champions in the faith and from living this kind of life of total abandonment to you. Holy Spirit, come, 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 more, more. Thank you, Lord. If you've been inspired by this message, we invite you to partner with us by visiting storehousedallas.com forward slash give.